Occupy Brooklyn TV. I'm Melanie Butler. And I'm Atik Zabinski. From its very beginning, the Occupy movement has been characterized by a disdain for electoral politics. Its members have consistently taken the position that the movement will not endorse any political candidate. Furthermore, many members believe that voting is futile and even feel that refusing to vote is a powerful political statement for people wanting radical change. Nonetheless, with the national election approaching, some members of the movement are getting involved in one way or another in electoral politics. We devote this episode to a panel discussion on the issue. Introducing the panel now is our own Harry Waysbrin. Today we'll be exploring the relationship between Occupy Wall Street and elections. Obviously it's an important question with the election on the horizon, but a difficult one that there's been a lot of different discussion with since the occupation first began. And now with us, we have a fantastic panel with diverse perspectives to really explore all of the different attitudes people in the movement have with this. And just to start, going down the line with some quick introductions, we have Atik Zabinski, who is uh, active and a producer with Occupy Public Access TV. And we have Charles Lenchner of Organizing 2.0, who is also very active with the Occupy uh, Wall Street Tech Ops Working Group. Jenna Pope, put through. Jenna is an activist and freelance photo, uh, photojournalist from Wisconsin who is very involved in the Wisconsin capital occupation and Wisconsin recalls, who has recently moved to New York City. Next we have Eve Silver. Eve is an activist and artist involved with the OWS Allies Affinity Group and Occupy Faith. We have Gan Golan, who is an OWS organizer, who has been preparing actions for the elections, including a, creating a 13-foot-tall Bain Capital supervillain puppet, and is also co-founder of our beloved Tax Dodgers, which you can see at the Baseball Hall of Fame right now. And we have Josh Silverstein with us as well, who is a founder of the new chapter of Democracy for America in New York City and has been a supporter of OWS, who's organized, helped organize rallies and events, as well as petition efforts at OWS. And last but not least, we have Messiah Rhodes with us, who is active with the OWS Media Working Group, and is a filmmaker who is trying to organize a March of the Unemployed for the day after the election. And without further ado, to start, uh, again, I know you've been very involved with organizing the specific actions that are coming up in the days preceding and following the, uh, the 2012 election. Uh, do you mind just going quickly through to discuss what's on the docket? Yeah, I mean, I think the reason is important, you know, that because, um, you know, no matter who wins the election, Wall Street still wins. Uh, they have obviously own both parties at this point. And so our goal is not to get involved in the electoral process, to, but to make an intervention uh, into the electoral process and create a, a different place for people to get involved using the elections as a leaping off point. So we have uh, October 31st um, is of course Halloween. We have a uh, nightmare on Wall Street activities that are going to be planned, including a night of the living debt and a lot of fun stuff um, that really highlights the, the influence of money in politics. Um, and then November 5th, the day before the election, we're going to have a preemptive victory party on Wall Street itself. Um, it, where Goldman Sachs and other banks are, are celebrating their, uh, the fact that no matter who wins, they win, and you guys are all invited to wear your finest and uh, bring the, the, the drink of your choice. Um, and then November 6th itself, uh, Election Day, whether people choose to vote or not to vote, we are asking people to gather uh, in public spaces to show um, everybody what democracy really looks like and hold public assemblies. Um, we're planning maybe a, a, a town square in Times Square once the polls close and give uh, everybody a chance to speak and say what's on their mind and, and we're going to construct the people's platform. Um, and then the day after the election we're putting out a call to uh, everybody to take action on their issue and start to hit newly elected politicians immediately um, and go on the offensive against them and let them know that they're not our representatives because they represent those who paid for their campaigns and they're not our leaders because we're fully capable of leading ourselves. Um, at best, they're our employees. So we're going to show up on the first day of the job and tell them what we think they should do. And that's the general call for people and organizations to take action on their issues and uh, put the pressure on starting what we're calling not the day after, but uh, democracy day one. 
obviously that's a whole lot of organizing that's been going on. Uh, I know that there's been a continuing of what has now been termed Movement Mondays uh, mm -hmm. since S17 when uh, throughout the summer we've been meeting on Mondays to start planning for that. Uh, could you describe quickly what those meetings have been like and how all of this has really come about? Um, I think they're really just an information hub where all the different uh, threads of Occupy come together to discuss what they're doing, propose actions, find allies. Uh, you know, in the lack of having physical encampments, I think this is one of the many forums that people are gathering in order to coordinate collective action and, uh, and plan big things and work on campaigns together. That's great. And obviously there's been a <laughs> lot of discussion throughout in terms of the specific role of Occupy Wall Street within the electoral sphere. And Jenna, I wanted to bring this to you quickly because obviously you were involved in the Wisconsin <clears throat> recalls. Uh, how do you see the, that experience coloring what your participation and your feelings about the elections have uh, become? Um, well, it caused me to completely change my views on electoral politics. Um, I will no longer be participating in the election. I will not be voting. Um, my participation in the recall election and all the work we put in um, and the fact that Scott Walker still won um, just kind of proved to me that it's all about the money. Um, it has nothing to do with what the people actually want. Um, so in my opinion, you know, voting does nothing. Um, so I'm choosing not to participate. And do you feel like this is an opinion that is held widely around Occupy Wall Street or have people uh, elsewhere or other occupiers in Wisconsin, let's say, push back against it? Um, I've had a lot of pushback. Um, I've gotten attacked for my views a lot. Um, but there are definitely a lot of people that do agree with my position. Um, so it, it really depends on who you talk to. Some people completely disagree with my position. Some people completely agree with it. So, And for a flip side opinion, uh, Charles, I know that you've had proposed something different at uh, one of these Movement Monday meetings. Uh, would you care to describe what that was like? Well, at, at one of the meetings, I proposed that we decline to endorse a specific candidate, but that we articulate that we all um, were opposed to the election of Mitt Romney and endorse activities that would result in his defeat. That sort of opens the floor for folks who, um, who want to support Obama or who want to support Jill Stein or who want to do an intervention that makes a difference between a swing state and a non-swing state. But I think the real question has to do with... Um, with where occupiers see themselves as a radical activist group influencing mainstream American politics. If you look at um, the 1930s, you're looking at radicals being at the center of the most important movements of the time, unemployed councils, the labor movement uh, organizing new unions. If you look at the civil rights era, you find radicals at the heart of the civil rights movement organizations, next to Martin Luther King, uh, at CORE, at SNCC, and so on. But today, when I think about Occupy Wall Street, I'm thinking about a lot of activists who, instead of being inside large people's movements that are mobilizing uh, broad layers of the population, I see them as um, a kind of a, a group that's branded themselves as the activists and the radicals and standing a little bit outside where a lot of the action is taking place. And I think when it comes to the election, I think what's important is that we actually put our radical selves inside the people's movement for change in this country. And overwhelmingly, that is a people's movement that is going to support the election of Barack Obama and would suffer greatly if it was Mitt Romney who was elected. So to speak, would you support an Occupiers for Obama kind of affinity group, or are you not going that far uh, at all? Or what exactly would you propose or prescribe? I think it would be a mistake for Occupy Wall Street to enter electoral politics by sort of expressing an Occupy voice in a partisan way. Um, that's definitely not the role I see for Occupy Wall Street. But I do think we should be in relationship to other organizations and movements that are taking positions and influencing actual elections. I also think it's important to take away some of the oxygen from presidential elections and remember that there are many, many elections at the local level where the people um, that are going to be elected influence our lives in very direct ways. And one example is the city council folks who have a great deal of influence on the stop and frisk policy that affects New Yorkers. Um, not participating in electoral politics also means not participating in changing those kinds of abuses. 
And with uh, the local politics in mind, uh, Eve, I know that you've had a fascinating experience as someone who has been very involved with local politics and organizing through Occupy Wall Street with city council members and the like. Uh, care to describe how that has colored your views, not only on city council elections, but electoral politics in OWS at large? Well, I think it's just the views I had when I came into the movement is that I wasn't afraid to recognize council members as potentially being in solidarity with the movement. Um, I like what Charles said about taking the oxygen out of a presidential campaign. Um, there are a lot of, when the question of voting comes up, there are a lot, a lot of other things to vote and about and reasons to vote. Um, Jenna made a blanket statement that voting does nothing. Well, on some local levels, it really does. For example, I've always had as a strict rule for myself, do not vote for anybody who is anti-choice, even for dog catcher. Because where they enter the system is at these lower levels of local politics. And it is us up, up to some of us to be gatekeepers, to keep some of these people out of becoming, uh, you know, having access to higher, higher and higher offices. Um, I think there has to be some recognition of the fact that a Romney presidency would be a disaster. And perhaps some might even say genocide in, in many communities. Um, in, the, in a way that an Obama uh, presidency would not be. I liked what Charles said about putting some of our energies towards at least framing that as part of uh, the equation here. Um, I'm not afraid to deal with local politics because I know that there are some people working very hard every day to protect what rights we still have. I know that because we still have them and the enemy is within. And the enemy is suggesting that all the rights we currently use every day as activists should already have been removed. And it had not been for the presence of some of those in solidarity with uh, America as it was originally or as it is what we dream of, you know, we wouldn't have those rights either. And Voting is one of those rights. <laughs> Indeed, voting is one of those rights. And uh, now I want to bring it to Josh for a second, who is an OWS supporter with an organization that does work within voting and electoral politics at DFA NYC. Uh, Josh, how do you really see your role with as someone who obviously cares as much about OWS as possible, but spends most of your time working within this sphere? Well, I'm in agreement a lot with what Eve and Charles are saying. I believe that you know OWS was a real game changer last year in how people talked about politics and what was important in our society. You know, voting for me is very important. Uh, it's only one aspect though of politics. I'm actually just taking a break here um, on the streets here in the west side of Manhattan to uh, get petition signatures for the paid sick leave bill here in, uh, in the city council of New York. Uh, if you guys have uh, been watching out, uh, out there Right now, a majority of the New York City Council supports uh, having a mandatory minimum amount of paid sick leave days for all workers, yet it's being held up by one person in the City Council, and that is the Speaker, Chris Quinn. So we're uh, gathering signatures on the street, and that's just one version of being politically active, and it's something that's you know, not necessarily, you know, being Democrat or Republican, but it's it's being out there and getting involved in issues that relates to electoral politics. And that's something that I care about. And it's something that I hope, you know, a lot of people will also get out there and get involved with. Mm -hmm. And I think you hit on something there where you talk about issues that relate to electoral politics or more broadly how Occupy can impact elections, even if we're not directly involved with them. And with that, I wanted to bring it to Messiah for a second, who had quite a funny Facebook post I saw the other day about how the elections were BS, but the memes are fantastic. <laughs> and just generally, from a cultural perspective, uh, how is Occupy playing into what we're seeing, and, and how do you view your role within it? Hello? Hey, we can hear you. Oh, yeah. No, yeah, I feel that, you know, culturally, like, you know, we actually have, like, a, you know, some people say post Occupy world, but Occupy is still around, so how can it be post? But, but it's just the fact that people have like a benchmark of they see of like radicalism in this country, you know, like we actually have 
you know, a presidential elections, how fraudulent it can be that they're talking about numbers. They're talking about the 47%. They're talking about, you know, 50%, you know, of Medicaid, you know, and, um, and culturally, like, you know, it's still like, I guess it's just like the fact that this is like one of the first like elections that has like a full spectrum of like media outlets. Like there's Twitter, there's Facebook, there's, you know, the Instagram, there's a whole bunch of outlets, the spectrum, you know, that really changes like people's perspective of the elections, you know, and like we get news faster over, over these lines than we do in the mainstream media. And it's really helps like, you know, the legitimacy of the mainstream media as well as going down. Like people really see the farce that's happening, you know. Mm -hmm. And with uh, online media in mind, uh, I wanted to bring it back to Gan, whose Bane supervillain costume has uh, started making a series of videos giving advice to conservatives and the like. And uh, Gan, how, how do you see as an occupier your role as creating these kind of media moments and, and the impact it has? Well, uh, personally, you know, as an artist and, and as an occupier, I really try and, and meet people where they are at. And there's a real strategy behind all these fun, humorous political satires because they really use the things that people are paying attention to as an entry point into a discussion that we are having that maybe isn't happening in the mainstream media. So using the, the villain from uh, the Dark Knight Rises movie, Bane, also Bane Capital, and making a giant puppet and going to Comic-Con, for example, suddenly introduces the whole debate uh, that Occupy Wall Street is having into this other cultural arena that may be totally apolitical. And I think that's why this kind of important spectrum of opinions that we're expressing here is, is really crucial because we can continue working on campaigns that are transformative and are outside the system and about building alternative models and institutions and ways of thinking, but we also need to create connecting points from where a lot of people are at so that they can get involved in those conversations and get involved in social movement activities. So the normal setup is that, you know, uh, during an election, all social movements are supposed to fall in line with an electoral campaign. And for example, get behind Obama. Some people are going to choose to do that. Some won't. But we can also see um, elections as a way to jumpstart social movement activity. So whether people choose to vote or not, um, the real question is not who we vote for, whether we vote or not, but what do we need to do in addition to voting to create the kind of change that we need? So I think that's really the point of agreement between all these different things, which is that voting by itself will not bring about the changes we need. So what else do we need to be doing and how do we get people involved in those things? And that's what those days around the election, those days of action are for, which is to connect the, the general population into all these other activities that Occupy is already doing um, starting from the day after the election and moving forward to really impact the entire political process outside of just the electoral arena. And we're, we're just encouraging people to think outside the ballot box, whether they choose to vote or not. And with that creative mentality in mind, uh, one thing you, I feel like really hit on as you were describing that was throughout the process of getting the signatures for the Wisconsin recall, the horizontalism of that movement, where anyone was able to uh, go to a website and download forms where they could pass around and have people sign, uh, sign themselves, really created a sense of people able to take this leadership on their own to do creative actions, where there were projects like the Overpass Light Brigade, for instance, which is similar to the Illuminator in many ways in terms of being something that uses lights in a really creative fashion to get people interested and engaged in politics that just might be driving across the freeway. Uh, and isn't yeah. that, I, no, oh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, you, you wanted to. Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, I always get a little uncomfortable when we for, refer to Occupy as some um, entity. I think uh, Occupy is a verb, and I think Occupy should be the signal for anyone to ask themselves, uh, what is within my reach to change? And in what way can I better occupy myself with the business of fixing this mess? We can't forget that what made center move further and further and further right infiltration of the Tea Party and other really extremely right um, movements into and right theologies into mainstream politics. And it is the burden of everyone to the left and the further left the better to engage in some of that same mannerism so that um, anyone in office can point to the crazy people on the left that they have to answer to mm -hmm. as much as the crazy people on the right. It has been our absence, absence 
Is, am I saying that right? Yeah, in this, in the, um, in the mainstream that has allowed um, our furthest left candidate to be only slightly left of Ronald Reagan right now. Hmm. And Jenna, is this? Uh, how do you feel about your uh, these arguments as it relates to your position in in this way? Um. I, I'm not sure. I mean, <laughs> she she hit a lot of points there, um, and I wasn't really ready for it because you were asking me a whole other question. Yeah. Um, well, so. uh, to, re to restate, to restate, let's say the broader element of what we're doing in terms of these creatively based social movements that kind of come together for elections and can impact elections. As we saw in Wisconsin, there were all these things that have existed since after the recall that are still having a big impact just on occupiers there. Uh, do you see a connection between what we do in the street, the things that aren't related at all to elections, but still have that impact? That it still is ending up something positive. Yeah, there, there definitely is a connection. Um, if anything, the, those creative things that we are doing in the streets, the overpass light brigade, um, the illuminator, that kind of stuff, it's at least like bringing up the discussion, um, the discussion of politics and, and what's going on in our country right now, um, which at least at this point in time with the election coming up, a lot of times that does lead to talking about the election and candidates. Um, so I think it, it definitely does lead to, to conversation about um, the election as well. Um, Great. So. And uh, bringing it back to Charles, uh, Charles had a confrontational but really uh, poignant uh, email to one of the lists we were on that really made me think, where he, after S17 he said, okay, we've tried a year of activism, of actions, now let's try organizing. Yeah. And, and Charles, within that framework, uh, how do you see our relationship with electoral, uh, electoral politics proceeding? Well, I'm thinking now about uh, some of the writing of a really great guy uh, that I've, I've learned about uh, since joining Occupy, uh, Jonathan uh, uh, Matthew Smucker. And he writes about uh, um, the, the experience of the activist becoming kind of the center. In other words, the, this is what Slavoj Žižek called falling in love with ourselves, and he warned us not to do that. Um, a lot of the activists in Occupy Wall Street put an emphasis on the experience of being an occupier, the experience of being in a liberated space as a, as a kind of um, a spectacle that transformed the people who participate in it, changing their consciousness so that they can form the kernel of a new world uh, within the shell of the old. And I just like to debunk that a little bit and say that actually I'm much more interested in serving, um, serving people, large numbers of people, the vast majority of whom don't have the privilege to participate in our movements, the vast majority of whom are struggling with issues that might not give them sort of the opportunity to be reading, you know, Smucker and Zizek and participating in Google Chats. And for those people, we need to sort of make it about power, the power to influence wages that people get, whether they have health care whether hospitals are opening or closing in, you know, in their neighborhoods. And when you talk about power, you're talking about votes and money. Now, I'm, I'm sad, like everyone else here is, that money is such an important part of the American political system. I'd like to change that. I'd like votes to become much more important than money. I'd like to reduce the influence of money, you know, uh, as someone else said, to such a small influence that maybe we could you know, drown it in a bathtub. But in order to do that, you need to emphasize the voting part of the equation. So I would just pose it as votes or money. And if you decide not to participate in electoral politics, what you're voting for, in effect, is for greater influence of money in the system. And I'd like to change that and, and move away from a sort of a self-centered, it feels great to be a radical occupier mentality into one that talks about what we can win with our activism right now in this system to make life better for more people. And with that, I, I want to thank this, again, fantastic panel uh, for this great discussion, and we we'll hope to do this again sometime soon. Thank you, Harry. Great work moderating. Thanks. All right. Thank Take care, you. everybody. Well, Atik, thanks for participating in that discussion. And I'm wondering, you know, watching it, I really actually felt like Jenna was representative of the majority of voices within Occupy Wall Street. However, within the panel, she was really actually in the minority and I found myself wondering kind of how the panelists were chosen or, or how that was put together. To be honest, I think that what we had here was a case of, uh, well, certain people were not available. We tried, uh, there's always some people who are not available 
And also, maybe people who felt that way didn't think there was a reason to participate in the discussion because there that wasn't much, be. which is a pity because uh, there's good reasons for not participating in an election. It's, it is a statement that you don't believe in the electoral system the way mm -hmm. it is in this in this uh, country as it is. And uh, I note that when voter turnout is very low in some little country, uh, the New York Times is happy to report that they don't believe in the election. They openly scoff the results because so few people participated. So that's that's right, we and, think and about. it's not seen as a symbol of a functioning democracy. Right. Well, it's a, it's a great discussion, and I'm glad that you brought it to us. So it's very timely. And that's our show for today. Thanks so much for watching. And the next opinion we want to hear is yours. Get in touch with us. Give us a call at the number on your screen or send us an email and let us know what you think of the show, what you'd like to see on the show, and let us know most of all if you'd like to lend a hand because this takes a lot of work keeping the show on the air week after week. But till we hear from you next time, thanks for watching. I'm Atik Zabinski. And I'm Melanie Butler.